My name is John Morris, and I have the, uh, the honor of being the uh, director of the Knight Alzheimer's Disease Research Center here at Washington University. And uh, I'm delighted to welcome all of you to the seventh annual Norman R. Say Lecture. I'm here mostly to go over nuts and bolts. So number one, welcome. Number two, please put your cell phones on vibrate or turn them off. And number three, the uh, Knight uh, ADRC is very pleased to uh, thank the Lynx uh, for the reception that will follow the say uh, lecture today. The Lynx Incorporated is a service organization of African American women, one of the most uh, prominent such organizations in the world. They have chapters in almost every uh, state in the union. They're close-knit uh, and our uh, president of our, or a chair of our African American Advisory Board for the, uh, for the uh, Knight Alzheimer's Disease Research Center is, is a Lynx and was uh, at a meeting uh, elsewhere and uh, mentioned the SAY lecture and uh, we're very pleased that that resulted in uh, a Lynx from uh, Emory University in uh, Atlanta uh, having uh, Dr. Monica Parker, who's associated with the Alzheimer's Center there, uh, come all the way uh, to be here for uh, our celebration of the seventh uh, SAY lecture. So we're delighted. Uh, it's a personal uh, pleasure for me uh, to be able to offer these SAY lectures in honor of the founding chair uh, of our African American Advisory Board, uh, Mr. Norman R. SAY. Uh, and uh, he has uh, become not only a, a close a colleague and a very helpful colleague, but a close friend. So Norman, thank you again for all of your efforts. And it really gives me great pleasure to uh, 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 invite to the podium uh, Adrian Davis, who is the Vice Provost and the William Van Cleve uh, Professor of Law at Washington University in St. Louis, who will provide the more formal uh, opening remarks. So please uh, join me in welcoming Professor Davis. Good afternoon. <laughs> On behalf of Washington University, I would like to welcome all of you here today for the seventh annual Norman R. Say lecture. I'd like to thank Dr. John Morris, who's the director of the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center at Washington University, and also Andre Denny and Mertis, and Mertis Spencer, who are two indispensable members of Dr. Morris's team, who introduced me to the wonderful work that the Alzheimer's Disease Research Institute is doing here in St. Louis. I'd also like to also, can also add my thank you to the links Incorporated St. Louis chapter for your sponsorship of the reception. Not only is it a wonderful, generous thing that you're doing, but as some of you know, I have a personal connection. My, my great aunt is Georgia Rusan, uh, so many of, you, many of you know that, so I'm, I'm, there's a personal connection for me as well. I just want to take a moment to situate how important the work of the Research Center, and in particular this event and the African American Research Advisory Board are to not only the medical school and the hospital, but also to Washington University as an institution. Diversity is one of the most important things that we have to do at Washington University. And without a commitment and success at being open and inclusive to every member of our community, we will ultimately fail in our mission as a university. The Board of Trustees and the Chancellor have both identified diversity as one of the university's top institutional priorities. And what we've learned is that part of doing diversity, part of prioritizing diversity, means doing things differently. It means doing business differently on a daily basis. And being open to doing things differently has led to some extraordinary successes. At the medical school, we now have three women department chairs, the first three in the medical school's history, and they promise to transform the institution. I think that many of you probably know Dr. Angela Brown, who works on hypertension. 
Dr. Brown, one of our new uh, department chairs, Vicki Frazier, has just appointed Dr. Angela Brown, along with Dr. Mero Castro, to be the co-directors of her newly created Office for Faculty Affairs that is going to focus on diversity and community outreach within the Department of Medicine. On our non-medical campus on the other side of the park, one of the proudest things that I'd like to report is that this year, 25%, and that's 11 out of 45 of our hires, were African American, Hispanic, or Native American. And for the... <laughs> and for those of you who've been in St. Louis and know Washington University, you know that this is part of doing business differently from the way that we've been doing it. Now, I want to return again to the medical school and why we're here today. When the first, within the first year of when I moved to St. Louis in 2008, Mrs. Margaret Bush Wilson invited me to lunch at her offices up the street because she knew that I had to meet Mr. Norman Say. And this was one of the most memorable moments, actually, of my life as a lawyer. As someone who works on social and racial justice in various forms, I could not believe that I got to spend over two hours in the presence of what I and many would call civil rights royalty. But they were not royalty. What I will always recall about that lunch, Mr. Say, was the complete humility and generosity and spirit of openness that you and Margaret extended to me. And when people, I'd see people around St. Louis, they'd say, oh, you know, everyone says St. Louis is provincial and it's not welcoming, it's open. I said, well, you were not at the lunch that I had with two of our most senior, influential citizens and how they treated me. Mrs. Wilson and Mr. Say saw themselves, viewed themselves not as royalty, but as what we call servant leaders, people who are doing service for social justice and so that our country really can finally live up to its democratic and its egalitarian potential. And I cannot think of an area where rights, inclusion, equality, and justice are more important than in healthcare. And in particular, in the diseases that are underdiagnosed and are undertreated in African American and other vulnerable populations. So today I look forward to the seventh annual Norman Say Lecture and all that it honors and all that it promises. Thank you. So it's, it's a real treat to, to invite Benita Austin, who is an advanced nurse practitioner at the Barnes Jewish Hospital in the Palliative Care Service and a member of the SAY Committee for the uh, Knight Alzheimer's Disease Research Center to introduce the seventh SAY Lecture. So, Benita. It is an honor to introduce the speaker for the seventh annual Norman R. SAY Lecture. I have the privilege of introducing a very distinguished researcher. Dr. J. Taylor Hardin is a nationally recognized leader in gerontological nursing. She is currently the program director for the National Hartford Centers of Gerontological Nursing Excellence at the American Academy of Nursing in Washington, D.C. Since the year 2000, this initiative which is coordinated by the Gerontological Society of America, has been addressing the critical shortage of leaders in geriatric nursing education and research. Dr. Hardin is the former assistant to the director for special populations at the National Institute of Aging, a position that she held since 1997 until her most recent appointment as program director for the National Hartford Centers of Gerontological Nursing Excellence. A Virginia native, Dr. Hardin earned her bachelor's degree in nursing at the University of Maryland, Baltimore. She served in the United States Army Nurse Corps. After returning to her alma mater, she earned a master's degree in nursing 
and following a change in service branch, she became an Air Force flight nurse. Later, while serving as an Air Force res reservist and as faculty at the University of Texas Health Sciences Center at San Antonio School of Nursing, she commuted to the University of Texas in Austin, where she completed her PhD. In the early 1990s, Dr. Hardin participated in the National Institutes of Health Extramural Associates Program in Bethesda, Maryland. This program prepares faculty and administrators to set up and strengthen research programs in their own institutions. While in San Antonio, Texas, Dr. Hardin reviewed grants on aging, on women's health, also on minority and behavioral health for the newly established National Institute of Nursing Research at the, NA, at the NIH. In 1994, she relocated to Bethesda, Maryland to work for the NIH, becoming health science administrator at the new National Institute of Nursing Research. In 2008, Dr. Hardin served as acting deputy director of the National Institute on Aging. As a leader in mentoring and training of researchers, she has facilitated the NIA grant technical assistance workshop in conjunction with the annual meeting of the Gerontological Society of America. As chair of the NIH Working Group's Women of Color in Biomedical Careers Committee, she has been instrumental in the creation of Women of Color Research Network, which is a social media site for those interested in diversity and the scientific workforce. Her leadership and track record is truly impressive, and it is evidenced by the extensive research activity, grants, and numerous distinguished presentations and publications. Dr. Hardin is a fellow in the American Academy of Nursing, an elected fellow of the New York Academy of Medicine, and the Gerontological Society of America. Throughout her career, she has received awards that include the 2005 Gerontological Society of America Task Force on Minority Issues, the Gerontology Outstanding Membership Mentorship Award, and the NIH Merit Award for Women in Biomedical Research Careers. Dr. Hardin is also a three-time award recipient of the NIH Director's Award. It is my pleasure and honor to present to you J. Taylor Hardin, PhD, RN. And uh, excuse me for just one moment, we have a photo opportunity. The seventh annual Norman R. Say lecture is presented with appreciation to J. Taylor Hardin. So if you want to take that. It is certainly my pleasure to be here with you today. I am delighted to have this honor and to also have Mr. Say in attendance. It is absolutely wonderful. I bring you greetings from the Gerontological Society of America and our Chief Executive Officer, James Appleby. I also extend to you greetings from my former employer at the National Institutes of Health, National Institute on Aging, Dr. Richard Hodes, who is the director. I'd also like to thank the organizers of this event. It's been a wonderful day, and I certainly appreciate the opportunity to meet with staff members, with uh, students, and with my fellow nurses. Special thank you to Dr. Morris, Ms. Spencer, Mr. Say, Ms. goodwin Wolfa. Dr. Royster, Dr. Parker, and the SAE Planning Committee, as well as the staff of the Knight ADRC. 
So we have a little time together and I wanna make sure that we get through the content. So this is the agenda that I have planned for you. And we won't ask if there are objections because that's what we have laid out at this point. Um, we'll talk a little bit about global population aging, a bit of an overview, talk just a bit about unequal burden before we go into the unparalleled research opportunities. I'll talk just a little bit more about unequal burden in terms of some of the barriers to research participation. And then we'll close with unparalleled training opportunities. And so this is a slide that represents what we're confronting in our nation. What you see here to my left is a representation that in the very near future, before 2020, it's anticipated that for the first time in human history, and probably for the remainder of my lifespan, that those over the age of 65 will exceed those under the age of five. As you think about this, it certainly has implications for retirement profiles. It has potential and implications for our workforce as we go forward, and certainly in terms of the health of populations worldwide. On the right, what you see is the representation in terms of projected increase in global population aging. And you can see we can expect a banner crop, if you will, of centenarians, those 100 years and older. Research in general, the reason that we're all here, has helped to improve health overall. And that's why across global populations, we began to see this longevity and improvement in health of older adults. Unfortunately, what we all know in this room is that not all populations, and certainly not all individuals, have equally benefited from the rewards of research, nor all they each enjoying the same degree of longevity in health. I'm here to talk a little bit about AD, and I actually appreciate this picture so much. So back in 1906, and based on a single case study of this woman, Dr. Alois Alzheimer, actually described behavioral disturbances, aphasia, and memory loss. Later, much later, with autopsy studies, post-mortem examinations, it was confirmed that this patient did indeed have the characteristic hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease. So I'll start my spill at this point about why we're here. So this is the result of brain post-mortem examination. It's an important adjunct to the type of research and science that we endeavor to engage in in terms of Alzheimer's and learning more about this disease trajectory. So the bottom line to this slide is back in 1906, there was the opportunity to examine brains we still need to have that opportunity. And I know as part of the initiatives here at the university, there is interest in people willing to participate in brain donation. Now, I don't know about your orientation, but from my own orientation and my beliefs in a higher power, I know I won't need this body when I leave this world. However, there is the potential for those left behind when I do leave to use portions of it to learn more about how we can live and how we've died actually and use that information for others that I will leave behind. So my first appeal is as you think about how you can engage, there is the opportunity to present and to share parts of your body with medical research. I know it's not for everyone, but this earthen vessel will not do us any good in the next 
life that we have planned. In this particular slide, you'll see the prevalence of probable Alzheimer's disease. On my left, you will see the numbers in millions, and we project somewhere between 4.6 and 5.1 million in terms of the prevalence of Alzheimer's disease. And if you look out, you see the numbers just continue to rise. This is not a condition that's going to go away. If we look at the projection on the right, the percent of persons with AD by age, we almost reach a one in two for those over the age of 85. What we need to have represented in these numbers is additional participation by minority groups in prevalent studies, not only of Alzheimer's disease, but diseases that are associated with Alzheimer's. This slide represents the neurofibril, I'm not gonna get it out, but the tangles and plaques that are characteristic of Alzheimer's disease. This is seen in autopsy. And what we need to know is more about these particular tangles and plaques and they, how they correlate with signs and symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. We can best benefit by having people engage in studies that will allow us to image these particular changes in the brain and begin to understand how we can correlate this with signs of the disease state. I'd like to talk for just a little bit about unequal burdens and some of the early signs of the disease state known as Alzheimer's. What we know is that the research of today is not the kind of research that was done back in 1906. I'm not certain that that one patient um, gave all the informed consent that one would have today, but what you need to know today is that for people who engage in research, there are particular protections. Um, we have protections in, form, in the form of informed consent. So you get a chance to see what people are proposing to do with you and for you. We also have something called the Institutional Review Board, which also looks out for your protections. So as we endeavor to know more about early signs and symptoms, again, I'm going to implore you to think about opportunities to add to the knowledge base. When we think about the early signs, um, what you typically see in individuals in the early stages, some of the things that I feel are almost characteristic of my own behavior right now, <laughs> that it's hard to remember things, but I'm documenting with my family and friends. I've been doing this for a long time. It's hard to remember things. Um, what you will often find is family members complaining. They've told that story over and over and over, 12 times in one day. But the individual acts as if it's the first time that they're sharing it with you. Of course, using certain executive functions, the ability to pay bills or simple acts of making change may begin to forewarn of changes in the brain. Losing things or putting them in odd places, and I really do find it's the odd places. You'll find things hidden. People can't remember where they are. You look in the freezer and you may find those odd things placed and getting lost. And here it's not such a matter of the wandering, which we'll see in the later signs, but here getting lost when you have set out on a course deliberately and for some reason you can't quite figure out how to map your way back home or to your next destination point. Later signs, all from the benefit of research that we can begin to characterize this. Um, you'll see as the disease progresses, 
forgetting how to do routine tasks. And often, onlookers will say, oh, the person is just not taking care of themselves in the same way. Families will often not attribute it to a change in brain pathology or the disease progression. It's simply that they have forgotten or they don't care about that anymore. Forgetting the names of things, and I underscore here that it's the name of things, not so much the names of people. That comes much later in the disease, but forgetting the name of things. And confusion, I've been confused about time, place, and people for a while now. And so again, documenting that this is not a critical change for me. But the wandering away from home is what we all hear and that we dread, because you see this represented in news, be it on TV, the appeals on radios looking for lost loved ones. However, in some population groups, like minority males, wandering may not be discovered, especially if they're homeless. And so no one misses them, and they just continue to wander the streets. So I think the males represent a particularly vulnerable group when we talk about these later signs and the unequal burden of AD. Now, these are some of the risk factors that go along with those signs. Factors affecting Alzheimer's disease, we've clearly seen age, and that by the age of 85, we're looking at about one in two um, in terms of prevalence. We've heard more and more about issues related to head injury as being a risk factor, especially when it comes to football. We're hearing more and more about the children <laughs> that participate in these particular sports. We've seen it with girls in soccer as well. What we don't know is the long-term consequences when the brain is injured very early. Because of our war efforts, we're beginning to learn a little bit more about head injury and again, the consequences of those injuries in terms of early onset AD. An issue for many minority population groups, but particularly African Americans, relates to this issue of high blood pressure, as well as cholesterol. We have research results from individuals who have participated indicating that this really does increase your risk of Alzheimer's disease. Diet and this is an area where we're still trying to figure out the overall consequences, but there are some correlations with onset of Alzheimer's disease. In terms of occupation, um, some of the risk, high risk behaviors, um, high risk occupations, I should say, in terms of um, behaviors on your job, um, actually put you at risk. I, I would be interested to know more and more about firefighters so they go in with the respirator mass, but at times that's not always sufficient and the cumulative over a career of smoke inhalation. Um, we also look at education and know that from research that there is a correlation in terms of the number of years spent in the educational process and the kind of cumulative fun or reserve knowledge. And what you might be able to relate to is, my mother used to say to me, I've forgotten more than you'll ever know. And so she was expressing that reserve uh, of knowledge. And so we often see this in Alzheimer's disease, that um, for different population groups, there's not much of a reserve in terms of brain function, and um, it's related to the education. Exercise, it's been a highly um, important area to the NIA to invest in exercise. And what we know is what's good for the heart tends to be good for the brain. And so I would encourage you to have a regular 
exercise routine to engage in that. Not only is it good for the body, but we're beginning to document in terms of research finding the beneficial effects of this. And social contacts also. What we find is people who are living alone, that have very small networks, tend not to um, engage in social contacts and exchanges in the same way. And from research, we're beginning to find that there's a consequence to that, and it's sometimes manifested as Alzheimer's disease. What we find is that engaging as you are today in new learning or extending your learnings actually stimulates brain activity. So we want to continue to use and engage in those activities that challenge us. And I know there are a lot of popular games and promotions out there. It's, it's not about a game or a particular video or any single routine, but it's the variation in the contacts and the richness and the numbers of contacts that you have that proves to be beneficial in terms of brain health. When people are devoid of those kind of rich contacts, that's when we begin to see them at increased risk for Alzheimer's disease. A few that I don't have on the slide here, but I'm sure some of you are aware. When we think about alcohol use, and if we talk about cholesterol and diet, it's not a far reach to also think about diabetes as also being a risk factor. However, this particular slide is from the cardiovascular health study. And I've included it here just to show that this same kind of analysis was done in midlife. And what the researchers were able to show is kind of opposite of what you're seeing here on this slide. And basically what you're seeing is that the risk of dementia by body mass index, according to this particular study, was lower on the green line. And if you look at the legend, the green line, I'm sorry, was greatest, um, I'm getting myself mixed up here, that the underweight BMI, they had less than 20, had the greater risk of AD, of dementia. In midlife, it was reversed. Um, and actually, they found that it was more of the anticipated in terms of being obese or overweight, that it did correlate with um, increased risk of dementia. The purpose here is that we don't quite have a firm grasp of the role of BMI or diet. So there's much more for us to learn as we go through this exchange and try to learn more about the roles here. When we, I've mentioned educational attainment. Here you see representation of the educational attainment of the population by race and Hispanic origin. What you'll quickly note is that for black or African American alone in Hispanic groups, that indeed the educational attainment is less. As we know, the skin color, the type of interpretation made of certain assessments, be they formalized psychological exams, or it can be colored also by the perspective of the person doing the assessment. So what I mean by that is this is documented in terms of low educational attainment. Some people might even view this and begin to generalize to all people. Well, you know, that group, they don't finish high school. That group does not go on for advanced degrees. And so when that group shows up in the healthcare system and that group is having psychological problems, sometimes that group 
can be labeled as having some kind of dementia, or at least raise the suspicion that that may be going on. We now need to know much, much more about the role of educational attainment and how it can um, affect the psychological measures. We need more sensitive assessments. This is work represented by Dr. Jennifer Manley. Dr. Manley is at Columbia University. And what we see in this particular slide is an extension of the educational impact. And basically, we have an objective test, that's the wide range assessment test, um, and it's the version three, and it's the objective measure of one's cognition and achievement around reading. And then you see the self-reported years of education. So let's just look at the 13 plus line, starting on my right. So of the number of participants in this, 40 were assessed as having 13 plus um, reading level, and it matched up appropriately with the objective assessment. But let's, let's look again at that 13 plus line with the objective assessment. People that thought they were at the 13 plus actually reading at the nine to 10 year level. And then some that thought, um, I'm sorry, looking at the wrong line, the 13 plus, so 40 actually reading at the 13 plus, another 40 that reported, self-reported 13 plus were actually at the nine to 12. Three of them were actually reading at the seven to eight, and one was actually reading at four to six. This becomes important when we think about how resources have been allocated in our nation for education and begins to at least raise questions about where were these people educated and what kind of educational systems and supports were in place. What we found is that some of the southern schools did not invest in education in the same way that northern schools. So when you encounter your clients and you're inquiring about their level of educational attainment, some might say, oh yes, I completed my formal schooling. But the one thing we have to remember is that the formal educational attainment for many in the South was about fifth or sixth grade. That was all that there was, and so they actually did complete their basic education. So just keeping that in mind as we go forward. So, just a little bit about AD, some of the assessments, and how we can have unequal burden manifested in a disease as well as some of the assessments. Before we go on and talk about some of the unparalleled benefits inherent in research, I'd like to pause just a moment and engage with you about some of the barriers to active engagement in research. And what we find is that when prospective participants come to a facility like this, we hope that there is a certain level of engagement, a welcoming environment. Um, it does us as researchers a great disservice when they encounter people who do not demonstrate basic human dignity. What do I mean by that? You walk into a facility like this, which is quite impressive, but you hear comments or you see things that just do not say that you value human dignity. So recent examples, when there are degrading comments about, say, the President of the United States that looks more like me than John. If I hear that in an environment like this, I might begin to think, you don't think very much of me either as we go along. So as we attempt to recruit 
underrepresented groups, African Americans, Latinos, to research. I know our job is difficult. Not only do we have to think about our research, but we have to think about the development of those in our environments to make sure that everyone is playing on the research team, that the environment is welcoming from the police officers on the street right up to the actual care providers. Breaches anywhere along that trajectory can impact our ability to recruit and retain those that you indicate that you want to include in your research. I also have on here fear. Fear on the part of research participants that can go back to legacies of Tuskegee. If I leave my brain to you when I come into the hospital, then I won't get all the care that I deserve because you really want my brain. Well, you have to remember that we have protections in place. It's not like times of the past. And you're bright people, you're here. As you spread the word about this, share with others that there are research protections in place. And any time, especially in this particular setting, if a person is fearful or feels threatened, there are resources that they can go to. If there is information that's unclear, if you're involved with John Morris and his research, you can actually reach out to John Morris and have those issues, those areas of concern clarified by him or by a staff member. So we have to confront our fears at a certain level. Now, there are other fears also, and I'm not totally sure of all of the origins of this, but for healthcare providers, and I'm not sure I'm labeling it correctly, but a fear of engaging with population groups that they're unfamiliar with. So there is a distinct separation or distancing. I would say to healthcare providers, you have to do the same thing that your patients and research participants are doing. Learn to reach out, try to bridge the divide. Um, not every African American male that you meet on the street in the evening is there to do you harm. Um, not everyone that you see in the clinical setting um, is unemployed or um, seeking some kind of services without um, compensation for those services. So a lot of fear-based stereotypes that need to be confronted. In terms of costs, Definitely barriers, um, cost in terms of travel and time. We also have to be concerned about those individuals who are uninsured and underinsured as well, because research can represent an additional burden to them, especially if they are underinsured. We have to think about com comorbidities in some of our research studies. Many African Americans and Latino population groups are excluded because they have other health issues that exclude them. So thinking back when you're designing your studies, are there other ways that one might reach the target population and not have them excluded simply on the basis of their comorbidities? And of course, we have to think about discrimination. The past history of the university structures, um, race, racism, and social equality still exist in many corridors. And I think what we need to do are have frank conversations around what it means in terms of race. And I'm not a proponent of removing race as a variable from research. I think when we remove that, and some people do advocate that, just let's use diversity. Um, but I think there's something important to be gained when we have race in our models of analysis. 
um, it really does help us to reach some of the associated findings in terms of that collective cultural experience and um, being able to think about a lifetime of differential t treatment and race serves as that kind of marker. So I would say these are just a few of the barriers um, that we have to confront in terms of including African Americans and Latino population groups, Asians and American Indians in our studies as well. Not in any way exhaustive, but a few that I wanted to highlight. In terms of unparalleled opportunities, I think you're in one of the best places in terms of research opportunities. The Memory and Aging pro um, Project here at uh, this university stands as a model. I believe that the community engagement, the advisory board, all of the resources that have come together in this one place to try and help us better understand Alzheimer's disease speaks well and it's an opportunity for you to engage. One of the things that is critically needed in Alzheimer's disease research is for recruitment and retention of healthy normals, the comparison group. And so it's not always a matter of having the disease, but if this audience could help us get out the word about the need for people who have no symptomatology, there is a place for you in research. In return, you get regular assessments to track your health. That's not a bad exchange. Healthy, normal, doing your regular thing, in exchange, you get this very careful monitoring and the ability to enrich um, a research data set. I'd like to talk just a moment about the importance of brain imaging, and it is for these reasons that we'd like people to engage in research and participate in this. Um, identification of early changes in the brain, assessing brain markers of disease progression, and also looking for surrogate markers for assessment of interventions. Now this is a typical model for, and it's used by the ADNI, which stands for the Alzheimer's Disease Neuroimaging Model. Um, the ADNI, as we call it, is a collection of research centers and sites that are working on the problem of Alzheimer's disease. And what we're trying to do is better identify the pre-symptomatic or the preclinical phases. As you can see on this slide, when we look at using cognitive performance, such as that reading test that I indicated, or if we look at function, a person is able to do simple math, balance checkbook. It will help to differentiate when we look at early changes in cognition, later changes, and certainly when people are demented. Does very little for us in that preclinical or pre-symptomatic period. However, associated with the need for finding additional strategies to help inform that pre-symptomatic period, these ADNI sites researchers have been able to look at now brain imaging. So this is a slide of MRI over 12 months. And what you see is this legend on my right, um, actually on your slide on the left, that shows that in the center you'll see the gray matter and that gray range is considered pretty much the norm. As we lose gray matter, you'll see more of this blue color representing less of an uptake um, in the brain. And what you have in the top half of the slide is someone diagnosed with AD, and what you see are changes in brain structure, evident on MRI, so a picture. You can see in the lower half of the slide, the 
person diagnosed as being a normal control, some of those individuals that we'd like to recruit um, in this particular setting. No symptoms, just acting as a normal control. And you can see all of the gray matter representation here. What this, when we add this to the assessment portfolio, what you see here is that we begin to make some advance in terms of a preclinical assessment using MRI. We want to push things earlier in the trajectory of the disease because then we can begin to have targets. We'll see the same thing here with something called PET image imaging. This is tomography, basically enhanced. And you get a little tracer and kind of lights up the picture of the brain. And what you see in the normals at the top is a well lit brain, if you will, showing blood flow. In the bottom half, you see the restriction in blood flow with these tracer elements. When we add this to the AD progression, you can see we do even more. This is what research helps us to do. You might ask, so if this is the pre-symptomatic, preclinical assessment, do you really want to know? I think it becomes important, what we hear from families all the time, that it's very important to know because it helps you to begin to plan. And this becomes one more tool in the arsenal in terms of AD progression and understanding what it means to be pre-symptomatic, what it means to be an early, mild cognitive impairment, the late stages, and then in dementia. So this is another helpful tool and research with participants like you and hopefully others in the community, we've been able to make this kind of advance. Without research participation, we would not be here. This is a study based on the Health and Retirement Survey. And I am transitioning now to talk a little bit about caregiving based on this particular slide. What we know is that there are about 42 million caregivers and they're providing about $420 billion of unpaid care. And in this particular slide, what you will see is that if you live alone, male or female, your receipt of informal caregiving is about equal. Let's turn our attention to married. And you'll see women, if you're married, you still receive less or fewer hours per week of informal caregiving. The take home messages here is that women do render a great deal of support and services to family members. And in this particular, it is to the advantage of men um, because they receive lots of caregiving, informal caregiving. And then you can see the overall, and this was significant. So, the real take home message is that families are important. Women take on great responsibility for caregiving, not only for those that are ill with dementia or Alzheimer's disease, but sometimes they're also caring for younger children. There's a resource available now to help caregivers, and that's found at www.eldercare.gov helps people with resources to support them in their caregiving role. Not a big stretch of the imagination that we want to keep caregivers healthy because they render tremendous health care supports in our current health care system. The NIA invested heavily in research for caregivers and this particular study looked at caregiving and there, it was an intervention study and basically we found that a certain set of supportive activities help to reduce clinical depression in caregivers, this becomes important, and nursing home placements for 
individuals who were diagnosed with illness or dementia. And it was significant. This intervention um, really changed the course of events. So this is a good thing. As we looked at overall caregiving and patient well-being, again, you will see the intervention worked in three different underrepresented, I'm sorry, two underrepresented groups, Hispanic and Blacks, and one might say, well, the intervention seemingly worked best in Hispanic and not as much in Black or African American populations, but it did indeed work. We need to better understand. There are some thoughts that um, in terms of support, depression, self-care, some African American caregivers actually um, recognize the depression, um, but don't necessarily accept all of the services and supports that are available to them. So their burden in terms of caregiving can remain quite high. Wanted you to know that there are several clinical trials being offered with support from the National Institute on Aging, 30 active clinical trials, large and small, and they cover a wide variety of interventions. But what we know is that currently there is no real cure. We're not able to prevent this. We are working on slowing. Of primary prevention trials, there are seven of those. Two are NIA-funded cognitive AD measures, and they're add-ons to existing studies. So here we're leveraging our investment in research by having add-ons to really assess AD outcomes. These are just some examples of trial results, so we can feel good about our investments in these research um, studies. So when we look at Denipazil, delays development of AD, for a limited time. We need more participation and more studies to see if we can improve this particular profile. Um, selective estrogen receptor modulators thought at one point to delay likelihood of developing AD in women. I think more research has um, raised more questions about whether or not this is actually helpful. Aerobic exercise, I've already said, has improved um, executive function. It's a good thing, good things for the heart, usually good things for the brain. And cognitive training can indeed um, Im have improvements. Don't necessarily transfer to other traits or other tasks as we go forward. There's a large um, scale randomized clinical trial based in Baltimore and they're generalized to other states. It's called the Experience Core. And this particular study, older adults volunteer in public schools. It yields a benefit for older adults. This is some of that social networking and social contacts. Um, it has proven beneficial for the children and the schools to have these um, experienced volunteers in the setting. And you'll see some um, 700 people, 60 years and older, they actually received a little incentive to participate, which allowed them to do a few personal things in their lives, you know, a little extra, few extra dollars as an incentive to participate. Um, there's also a nested brain health sub-study in the 80 plus year old participants, and they're now looking at um, changes in the CNS system, central nervous system. This just shows one of the advertisements of one of the participants and the enthusiasm of the children, but also the enthusiasm of the research participant. So in this kind of study, it's leveraging those social networks it is really engaging the mind so this person doesn't have to go out and play any kind of game. 
they're actually doing meaningful activity to use the brain, to use the skill set that this person came with. Um, and this pays off. They actually are getting up every day, leaving the house, and so they're getting in a little more exercise. And importantly, in this particular study, it also showed a reduction in TV watching. Now, everybody in this room would agree that's not the best use of your time. You get a greater return on your investment by walking that hour or two hours that you would spend. But what we found here is that in the intervention group, they reduced their TV viewing by two hours by those in the controls actually increased their TV viewing up to about seven hours. Usually that TV viewing was done alone. So again, that isolation effect. Um, these are just some of the outcomes, but I'm gonna move along quickly. Higher activity, bigger social network, television time, and the retention. These volunteers returned year after year to engage in this activity. That is the best outcome for researchers, right? Where your participants want to come back time and time again. Um, we now have attention of the um, president, and we had a presidential initiative um, with the National Alzheimer's Project Act that gave a little bit more money to Alzheimer's disease research. And so the nation is aware of the potential problems that we're confronting and the need to invest more in this area. And so um, you'll see Dr. Ron Peterson, which I, I know is known to Dr. Morrison, um, but is a well-known researcher is heading up this particular advisory group, um, giving advice to the federal government about how we can better um, advance research, hopefully enrich our outcomes from that research. I'd like to turn my attention just briefly to the issue of training. And what's important on this particular slide is that this data is from, re, from actual data collected at the NIH. And what it reveals is the allocation, if you will, of research grant funds to minorities. And what you will see here is, if we just look at the research programs, and you will see that the percentage of representation among these groups is very, very low for American Indian, Alaska Natives, just about 1% of federal funding. You see it continues with black, less than 1%. Not overwhelming for Hispanic either. And Asians doing a little bit better. I wanted to show this because, again, it underscores the need for us to think about our training <coughs> pipeline. And so we're going to really maximize our investment in research. It would behoove us to have scientists that can really actively engage with the populations of interest. If you have an opportunity to work with scientists from these groups, partner with them. We want them to be successful. We think it really does represent one of our greatest hope for addressing Alzheimer's disease and dementia among minority and underrepresented groups in science. This is really dismal. NIH is aware. They're trying strategies, but as you know, Scientists require certain reading level, a certain ability in terms of the sciences, help people to turn off the TV to study, and hopefully to find that science careers can be attractive. We really do need to think about succession planning and developing a pipeline. These are some of the initiatives. It's a busy slide. And let me just distill this a little bit for you. Focusing in on the center bar, what I want to share with you is that the NIA and NIH has training programs 
at the pre-baccalaureate college level. So they're trying to push interventions down earlier in the educational pipeline. Um, historically, we've had training at the graduate medical school level, and you can see the training initiatives. At the NIA, we have one that's focusing in on that pre-bat college level. A few more when we talk about graduate medical student level and a few related to postdoctoral. And then those at the career stage, you will see some training opportunities related to the Summer Institute on Aging Research. We have Rick Mars, that RCMAR stands for Resource Centers on Minority Aging Research. These are centers of research across the United States that really attempt to address health disparities that are trying to increase health span, not just lifespan. And of course, the Alzheimer's Disease Centers and the Alzheimer's Disease Research Centers also train individuals. What we need to do is to be able to refer people to these particular sites to know that there are opportunities. We also have a program of various supplementation to existing research projects and these can be added on. If you're interested in any of these, certainly I'll be available after this presentation and we can talk more about that in detail. Um, there are flexible deadlines for these supplement programs. Importantly, I want to announce that there are supplement programs for individuals, male or female, who've been out of research and they want to re-enter into an active research career. There is funding to make that available. Note that this is re-entry, it's not entry, it's re-entry, which says that you've had a presence in science, but maybe had to take a break because of child care or just caregiving responsibilities for a parent, for a child, for a spouse. We have a number of Resources available, if you Google the term ADEAR, which is Alzheimer's Disease Education and Research Centers. A number of resources available. You can get a limited set free. If you need large volumes of this, there is a small nominal charge. And you can see toll-free information, publications, and support for clinical trials and recruitment. And I'll end with this particular slide should you need to copy this down. It's been my pleasure to be a part of the SAY lecture series. I'm honored to have had the opportunity to share with you a little bit about some of the issues in terms of unequal burden some of the barriers to research participation, and then to look at some of the opportunities and benefits that have accrued to us as a population because of our investments in research. Thank you again, Dr. Morris. Thank you, Ms. Jusay. Thank you, ma'am. And thank each of you for sharing your late afternoon, early evening hours with me. I'm delighted to have been a part.